Welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast. My name is Robert Llewellyn and the Fully Charged Show is a now nine-year-old YouTube channel about electric vehicles, the future of transport and energy. Of course, most of you know that who are listening to this, but just in case someone's stumbled upon this where well, this uh, podcast and doesn't know anything about the show, that's what it's about. It's on uh, YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, if you Google Fully Charged Show, you'll find it very, very fast. Now, close to 500 episodes about just about every electric vehicle that's ever existed and loads of other stuff. Batteries, solar panels, ground source heating, uh, air pump heating, all those, or heating. Heating, we're doing a lot of. There's not so much about that yet, but there's going to be some. <laughs> electric airplanes, electric boats and ships, electric ferries, electric everything. Uh, extraordinary stuff a lot of stuff about battery technology why am i talking about this now that's not what this episode's about this episode was recorded at fully charged live 2019 at silverstone in june this year uh, and as many of you know we hosted tons of talks well okay 33 talks but if you know if you're going to have one talk and you suddenly got 33 that's tons and in this particular episode recorded at the event we are discussing how to live an electric life now, I was joined in the Giga Theatre, which it was amazing. It was a huge theatre, a lot of when it was full and lots of people standing at the back. It was very popular St- in the in the Giga Theatre, and I was joined there by Chantelle Shearing from Jaguar Land Rover, Will Vaught from Tonic Energy, and Niall Riddell from EDF Energy. And as with previous talks, oh, this is kind of annoying because we really tried to get this right, but it it's technically difficult um i'm afraid the q a section of this talk was not recorded properly so ben the tireless and lovely producer of the fully charged show podcast lends his dulcet tones so you can understand what was said so what all we've done is he's just revoiced exactly what people asked we haven't made up fake questions in case you're wondering that so without further ado please enjoy our talk about how to live an electric life Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, How to Live an Electric Life. So one of the things that we all know, I mean, a lot of you here, I know, drive electric vehicles. I know there's a lot of people who might want to. Not everyone here has has got an electric car yet. But what we're going to talk about now with some really interesting people is how this is developing, how things are changing, how things are are getting a little bit easier for early adopters of electric vehicles. Um, So I'd like to welcome onto the stage Chantal Shearing from JLR. Thank you, Chantal. Uh, Will Voot from uh, Tonic Energy. Thank you, Will. And Neil Riddell from Electric Vehicles Lead at EDF. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Neil. So, um, oh, I'm just going to sit down. It's so nice to sit down. Uh, so, the, the, yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the most, the second most common complaints I get uh, on Twitter, like it's my fault, I quite like that, and I feel guilty, is about the public charging network. And, the, and then and the one that's disappeared in the last few years is range. People always used to talk about range and they don't have the range and they haven't got the range. That's sort of faded a bit. Um, and also the other one is, well, if there's, everyone has electric cars, it will melt the grid. Those sort of three things are very, very common, uh, common things. But Chantal, yours is, your area is more about the actual vehicle and what the vehicle can do other than being a vehicle. Is that, is that a bad description of what you do? <laughs> um, so I look at the uh, e-mobility as our area and I look at the um, how the, the vehicle interacts with the infrastructure so um, my job is looking at how we engage with our off-car charging so effectively all of those complaints that you also get from the public charging network I also get right. as well so yes. we probably share most of them between <laughs> us. But just give us a quick update on the on the iPace because it's I just loved driving it. I mean, it was one of the, one of a real joy. To, we drove it around the Netherlands, mm-hmm. and it was, so, so when you do a long drive in a vehicle, that's when you kind of get to know it. And I just yeah, was absolutely. 
But is it is it doing okay? I mean, is it? Yeah. Is, are you yeah. shifting units? Basically? Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, right. It's a very popular vehicle, and uh, like I say, it's, so my my focus is really on how we support the customer using that vehicle out in the environment and and the charging and wall boxes and all of that sort of ex other ecosystem that sits around the car. Because I mean, would you think that? The, the most of the, the people who bought that car, is it their first electric car? I mean, is, is there, has there been a like, uh, uh, your Jaguar fan base, have, have they adopted it or have you gone to a sort of new lot of people, do you think? Um, definitely gone to a, a lot more uh, new audience as well, but definitely a fan base of Jaguar um, and Land Rover drivers coming in and wanting that Jaguar vehicle right. because it is electric as well, um, but also other electric um, vehicle uh, from other manufacturers right. as well. So the timing of it, some of the other vehicles were two, three years out in the market and yeah. perfect timing in terms of that next wave of dr uh, drivers that are considering or have got to the point where they really consider EV as a, as a credible vehicle right. for them to use now. Because at the moment, say if you went into a Jaguar showroom and said, I want to buy a Jaguar I-Pace, how long would you have to wait? <laughs> It varies, I wouldn't right. like to say, depending, but um, uh, you will have a wait. Right, it's but not a year? Uh, not at the moment, I don't believe. <laughs> oh, but some months? Yes, months. Oh, right, well, but that's a really good sign yes, in the sense yeah. that there's the demand and you're... So you are, um, and, the, uh, and the manufacturing of them is, is going ahead fairly smoothly, yes. battery sourcing is yeah. under yeah. control, all that stuff. Because that's presumably not your area. No, it's not my area, no. so I wouldn't want to comment on that. But, um, but in, in terms of if someone goes in and order, um, like I say, there will be a period of time to wait. But again, right. they will be getting the vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to Will. Um, tonic, I mean, Tonic Energy, what you've been doing recently is very exciting. It's sort of challenging the kind of existing energy yep. setup. Can you give us a, a brief rundown of the projects you're working on at the moment? Sure. So, brief intro, Tonic is a renewable electricity supplier that supplies clean, ga clean gas. We've got an in-house installation business called The Phoenix Works, who do uh, solar panel battery storage and smart EV charging, both for domestics and businesses. Um, we've grown pretty quickly in the last couple of years, and the whole business model is about not just supplying people kilowatt hours, because that's actually really boring, um, but trying to use these new emerging bits kit and configure them in a really interesting way in people's houses. Um, all of this is technically possible at the moment, but the work that we're really doing, focusing on, is trying to make it convenient and easily accessible, because at the moment, if you want this kit in your house, you need to be a bit of a smart facilities manager to do yes. it. Um, so we're running a whole bunch of innovation pilots and doing some pretty complicated stuff, uh, just to try and trying to be there ready when these things reach their inflection points on affordability and things, where it becomes less of an expensive hobby and more of a pure economic, sense. sensible thing yeah. to do. Yeah. And, and what about public charging? Because you mentioned, are you going into that space yeah, then? Yeah, so we, we've made a commitment to roll out quite a decent number of, of public charge points, and um, we're kind of setting up our mini industries and our business to make that possible, because it's anyone who know, who's been involved with that is really difficult to do it. Um, we're rolling out uh, charge points today that are pro predominantly one through like public tenders and things, so where councils want to roll out a number of them. But yeah, we've got some pretty decent ambitions to, to right. be part of that conversation. And then, Neil, that's, I think it's really interesting, the, the difference between the kind of established car manufacturers, where the transition from making, you know, as Jaguar, JLR have done, you know, making petrol and diesel engines to electric is quite a challenge. And we're seeing a lot of the, the fallout from that at the moment. Whereas the energy sector seem to be going, I mean, it seems less of a challenge. Right? I may be wrong. I don't know. Because if you've got 10 coal burning power plants and you know you're not going to use them, you've still got them. What are you going to do with them? You know, big, big investments. But Yeah, we're on a huge transition and EDF's an established utility. We're a multinational company and we've seen the emergence of a number of these areas for a long time. And you know, smaller companies are starting to adopt these technologies. So we, I sit within our innovation division and we are actively pursuing a number of the smaller te scale technologies as well as the large ones. But as a system, as an energy system, we've been on a hell of a journey. Um, I mean, back 10, 15 years ago, we were coal dominated, gas dominated. Um, and, you know, the last 10 years or so, the explosion in the amount of uh, low carbon sources we've now got means that we're heading towards a 50% decarbonized grid. 
And to get those uh, electric vehicles really into a state where they're you know, really low carbon, we're focusing on the generation side, and we're a very large generator. We're the largest generator of low carbon electricity in the UK, um, and also supporting our business customers and our domestic customers, of which we have a very large number on that transition to a more electric um, and low carbon lifestyle, where electricity is that pillar that helps people convert into the decarbonized world. Right, and I mean, are you, because forgive me for not knowing this, I should know these sort of things, but it's, or ignorance is always a strength. Are you doing things like charging, you know, like household domestic charging stuff that is through EDF? I mean, that is part of the... Sure. The so about um, six months ago, we made quite a significant commitment at a, a group level across Europe to be the largest provider of low-carbon electricity to electric vehicles, uh, to roll out a huge number of uh, charging stations, both public and private, um, and to be a leader in smart charging. So today we're, um, we've launched uh, something which we're calling Electric Adventures through Generation Electric, so a nice link to the Rivian guys and their electric adventure, but we're trying to engage our customers in that journey. And of the three million domestic customers we have, a very large number are electric vehicle drivers today. So right. together with partners, we've launched a, uh, a low-carbon um, home tariff, a smart charging tariff, together with a smart charger and an option to lease a vehicle through us. So we're doing a bit on the domestic side, we're supporting fleets on the business side, uh, we've got a really strong interest in vehicle to grid, um, and then we've got this you know, longer term ambition about public charging infrastructure as well. Because I mean, that is the big change that I see in that area is from centralised, you know, one massive great big power station that sends power down the wire, you know, to smaller, to smaller kind of wider distribution. Is that an, that's an area that your that your EDF so are looking been, at. I've been hugely lucky. I had an opportunity to help write the carbon budgets back in 2008, and that was all about you know marginal cost of generation and driving down the cost of these centralised technologies, but also the emergence of small technologies. And through that period, you know, we've been able to observe the trend of uh, those smaller, lower cost technologies in the form of you know, domestic rooftop solar panels, um, large wind farm, large wind farms becoming further and further offshore all driving down costs through the system. So being a large vertically integrated player, we have offshore wind farms we've developed, we have onshore wind farms, but we also do you know, household level solar or you know, business level solar installation. So we're trying to operate across the whole holistic energy space. Because, uh, uh, Will, one of the things that I know I've had a, heard a lot about is the, the VAT increase on... I mean, yep. just talk about the... I don't need... Because I don't even know what it is. It, um, it sounds so, like fairly negative. So. I look at policy, it's part of my role is to, to assess forward-looking policy and figure out how we can avoid the impact of it if it's bad or maybe it might be something we want to get involved with if we've, there's an opportunity in it and completely missed us. So um, it's a, I think, reasonably obscure piece of European legislation that's come through, um, no commentary on Brexit involved, but um, it basically means that if your hardware costs are something like 60% of an installation cost, then you apply a 20% VAT rate to it rather than the 5% VAT rate, which you should get for domestic energy saving measures. So if you're looking at a solar and battery install, of which there's a lot of hardware cost, right. old regime, you would have been charged at 5% VAT, but now you've got a position where you might be charged at 20% 20, VAT, is... where it's crazy considering domestic coal purchases, which is still a thing, believe it or not, Charged at five percent VAT. So, oh, well, if you actually buy a sack so, of coal so that's delivered you to your house to burn your it, your house by coal, in which there are some quite rural communities which still require yeah. that. Uh, yeah, five percent VAT. Whereas your Tesla Power Wall and your really sleek, brand new, efficient solar panels might be charged at twenty percent. Right. So, um, needless to say, there's some upset yeah. businesses out there. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, because that's the thing, Chantal. I mean, have you noticed with your I mean, in a sense, you're more traditional Jaguar owners who, you know, who are mm -hmm. loyal to the brand, who then buy an, a, an iPace, who make that jump. Are, are, they, are, are you aware of anything where they go, I want to put solar panels? Because I'm generally guessing, this is one of my mm -hmm. current bugbears, is with my neighbours in the area I live who've got large SUVs, let's leave it at that, from various brands, mm -hmm. I'm not being brand specific, uh, who got somewhere off the street to park their car, have the money to buy a brand new car, now have really, they have no excuse not to buy an electric one. I mean, they don't have to yeah. buy a Jaguar, they could buy numerous different brands, but, and, and that, those are the people I want to say, let's be annoyed with them and make them buy. But are they then interested in solar panels in other domestic yeah. energy um, stuff? We, we've kind of seen uh, in terms of how we offer the vehicle, but also just generally that 
an electric vehicle across the board is quite a catalyst for, like you say, then looking at what these other things that you can add to the ecosystem are. And it's kind of a little bit of trying to, I guess, beat the system as well in terms of right now, if I have my own battery storage and how am I going to generate my own energy? So we definitely see a whole host of customers who buy our vehicles, other electric vehicles, who then want to really investigate that total ecosystem. So it's very much a sort of, it is a catalyst to that. But we also kind of do see the opposite, where people invested in solar and various other storage systems early, and the vehicle becomes that final step in, right. in it as well. So they might have had solar for other reasons, um, and their own sort of off-grid energy, and the electric vehicle also is a, a final piece to that. So we see those kind of two bookends, but absolutely, it's definitely customers are really now thinking about the, the next steps and about really about the smart, what makes smart sense in terms of whether it's necessarily green and it's technology and it's all of those kind of things. But absolutely, it's, a, it's definitely something we see. And are you getting, um, I presume, like the early adopters would, uh, and the people who already had electric vehicles probably wouldn't be anxious about that, but in people who, for, for whom, the, and I say, an iPACE is their first electric vehicle, is there concern about, uh, do they express concern about battery life and service costs and things like that, or they, is, that, is that a major problem or is that not really brought um, up that often? There are different levels, um, obviously with, with levels of different understanding of what, what there is, I mean obviously we, we tell the customers all, all of the information around battery life and, and, and everything that associated to that, that vehicle, so it can, it's very much dependent on where their knowledge base is, obviously as a, as a retailer we aim to make sure we give the, the buying public as much information as we possibly can yeah. to make that choice and to confirm it is the right choice. So that's obviously an important part of it right. as well. Um, and what, I think one of the th things that I've, off I've been fascinated with, uh, Neil, this is really for you, is that if uh, I generate electricity in my house and I can store it in a battery and I can then use that to run the house or even to charge the car, I'm buying less electricity from the grid, which tells me that that's not a terribly good business plan from the point of view of a large energy company that has made their living traditionally selling electricity that you buy from the grid. I mean, how... Because that's clearly going to happen more and more, and, it, or, and it's happening in certain European countries, it's happened to a very large extent. Does that, uh, um, presumably, you've worked out what that impact could be in yeah, the long we, term. Um, I mean, we're a large energy company. We're supplying uh, circa... 60, 70 terawatt hours a year of electricity, so that's you know, circa 20% of the UK market's electricity. And we've seen a decline in electrical demand since 2005. Um, you know, it's been dropping steadily over that period. And that's probably to do with energy efficiency in fridges and, and things. And much of the thing. economy, yeah. you know, various large industries leaving. But at a domestic level, yes, we're also seeing a decline on those you know, domestic usage. Um, I think the thing that's really interesting is that as people adopt uh, more technologies, they become more aware of it. So, buy an electric car, that increases your consumption by 60 to 70%. You buy some solar storage, that maybe brings it back down again. But the key piece for us is that energy, electricity is going beyond the kilowatt hour now. We're starting to understand and, and see people really engage with this and look at how they can maybe purchase on the basis of a, a monthly fee rather than a, a kilowatt hour fee. And this is the kind of marketplace we're looking at. You know, it's the kind of place we're all sort of observing and seeing yeah. our job ultimately, we live and breathe electricity. Most of our consumers don't really spend as much time observing it. Perhaps the, you know, the solo, the electrical vehicle drivers do more. But yeah. the reality is that we're starting to see you know, our job as being facilitating. The, the requirement for electricity is a core fundamental of what we have in our daily lives. Yeah. Conversely, our mission is to, whether you believe it or not, it's really difficult, which is why I have trouble personally with it, but we want to half our customers' energy bills. And that, right. if you include transport and things and electrifying people's uh, transport, then that becomes more achievable. But just be get, you get a different kind of relationship with your customers. So um, we're installing solar and battery and offering maintenance, or we're helping that battery operate in a more efficient way, or even helping that home improve the health of the energy grid by pumping out power at the right time. You, just, you get a different flavor of customer. And yeah. you know, to, to Neil's point, uh, the energy market's built off transactions, selling people kilowatt hours and issuing them a bill. I think that model is fast dying. So. Right. Um, so yeah, it's up to companies to kind of move into the space, create a completely different kind of relationship with people. And while it's a really challenging business case, selling people less but still trying to yes. uh, make money, uh, 
yeah, you, you just get a longer kind of more positive relationship because energy supply isn't the most positive relationship yeah. that you could imagine. Yeah. Issuing someone a bill for something that uh, we need to power every aspect of our life, um, especially when those bills go wrong, which they often do. But uh, yeah, you, you, we're just we are working towards a completely different relationship, and it could be a service subscription or even some of the most valuable customers might be the ones that we don't supply anything to, but are actually supplying power back to us right. so we can plumb it into other households. Because that's got to be a, a, I mean, certainly for businesses, the future for, for that is if you've got a large facility with a big car park, you know, like uh, Bentley have just done, they've just covered their car park in solar panels, mm -hmm. you then go, that's, that's very sensible at the moment, you know, with or without VAT, yep. for a big company like that, you know, they can really make a big reduction on their, their own power consumption yep. costs. Yeah, especially when you've got a big business, even with the feed-in tariff, which has been massively successful and kind of the, the spiritual successes being debated at the moment, it looks like it's going to be a bit of a flop. Saw a stat yesterday, 94% reduction in solar installs since yeah. 1st of April, which is a, a, a catastrophe, but I think the industry will um, recover. If you've got a big business or even a home where you can guarantee what your operation is going to be and what your load is like, uh, solar's an obvious choice in most cases, even to the extent that if you size it right, configure it well, a couple things like storage, you might be able to start making money out of that, especially when... We have got an increasingly variable electricity grid by the amount of renewables that we've got on it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, had negative power prices for 11 hours. For uh, 11, yeah, 11 hours? I didn't know so, it was that long. So there were some market aggregators, people who are responsible for keeping the, the frequency in the grid uh, in a stable state, uh, deploying loads of batteries to just withdraw power because wow. it was economically advantageous for them to do it. Yeah. But yeah, big business. It's, a, it's becoming less of a social conscious choice that they might be able to put in a CSR report to it is just making yeah. business sense to do yeah. I'm, I really want to open this up to I mean I'm sure people have got I'm hoping some people have got questions for, for the panel because this is a fascinating group of very clever people who know stuff this is directed to Chantal as an iPACE owner myself, uh, charging on a long journey is not that easy. Have you thought about connecting Jaguar with the Tesla network, which seems to be excellent? Where you can stop at a service station, they have 8, 10, 12 points of charge, whereas the iPACE can only plug into, say, two other stations, and one of them I wouldn't be able to use, and the remaining one wouldn't be working. <laughs> <laughs> I, get the, I get the impression from that look on Chantal that she's heard this possibly before. The other thing I want to, I want to add to that, because that's a really good point, but, uh, and I don't want to mention the make, but there is another major motor manufacturer who's recently released a large, uh, luxury, beautiful uh, electric vehicle, who have an account, the car has an account with every single charging network, they're saying in the world, but definitely in Europe. So you drive up in the car, you plug the car in, the car is recognized by the charger. You don't have to do anything. You don't need a card or an app or anything. And it starts charging. I'm just, that's yes. an add-on question. Okay. But yeah. yeah, but anyway. So um, the Tesla network, as many of you know, is actually a proprietary network. So um, iPACE is CCS and uh, Tesla is uh, their own connector methodology. So at the moment, you, you cannot do that. Um, and they are able to control the whole ecosystem because obviously they, ho they own the whole network. Um, Model 3 has CCS uh, and in terms of we're always in conversations with other OEMs and those regarding whether that we decide to use that network. We haven't chosen to do that at this time but who's to say in the future that that might not be the case. And in response to the uh, the plug and charge is what you're effectively referring to uh, on, on that particular vehicle. Um, that requires communication between, I'm going to try not to get too technical, but that requires communication of a specific standard between the, the vehicle and the charging station. It requires that both of them have it. Um, oh, yeah, so uh, if it's not on the charging station, yeah. which it's mainly on very, very latest new charging stations, then that facility doesn't necessarily actually work. Um, but in terms of the single card access um, in Europe, iPACE has exactly the yeah. same in terms of not through the vehicle, but in terms of a European membership to an aggregator of charging stations, which is what that other OEM yeah. does as well. 
Um, so we because actually do to, the same. to be fair, the, 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 it isn't that the, you don't just plug the car in and it starts charging. No. What you have to do is choose the charger on their on their screen, and you scroll up and you go, "I'm at charger number five at this location." But it does tell you where you are, yeah. and that you literally press that and it go, and then you plug in number five. Unless you faff about, you will see in the episode a little bit, and you're talking, and then you film, change the camera, and then when you go to plug it in. I couldn't open the door or plug it in. So it's not all that smooth. I managed to screw it up. I you, managed to make a mess of it. And in addition, you also need, obviously, um, an account or a to, network. So yeah. it doesn't rule out that you still need accounts with various operators or a single operator, depending on the coverage. Um, but it's just physically done through the, yeah. through the car. And we, obviously, we'll, we continue to look at that as well um, and other methods of other, how others also achieve that same principle. Yeah. But it was interesting when we used the iPACE in the Netherlands using the Fastnet network. The first time we did it, I plugged it in. I wasn't sure how that... I'd never used the app before, mm. and I had an app, and I did, oh, oh, there it is. Click, and oh, it's charging. Wonderful. We never touched that app again, because it did, that it did recognise the car. It. So, yeah. that, you know, we just literally plugged it in, it started charging. Yeah, so this is the other methodology of um, act effectively that Fastnet specifically uses, sort of auto-charge function is what right. they call. So it's triangulating between your account the MAC address on the vehicle and yes. Fastnet. So, as you say, every time you go and use that network, yeah. it recognises you and automatically will do all of your billing for yeah. you. Because it does great make, system. As you all know, so it makes such a difference if you don't have to. And, and having driven a Tesla for four years and got used to, you know, their charging network and driving all over Europe with it. And when you then go back, we now have a, a Kona, a Hyundai Kona, which is brilliant. But then you suddenly go, oh, it's a CCS charger. <laughs> And it's not working. <laughs> that puts a whole different crimp on the experience. But I've self-built two houses, and I'm very aware that I should be putting in battery storage and EV points. But the return on investment just isn't there. People say in 20 years you'll get your money back. So people are doing it for social conscience rather than financial return. What are your views on that? I think you're 100% right. Like Battery storage is really challenging at the moment for the economics. Um, a lot of the value in a battery is when you couple it with solar, clearly, but equally about what that battery can do to go and access a bunch of additional revenue from providing services to the grid and stuff. All of these things are technically possible, but they're really complicated, and it takes quite a lot of cost, time, and effort to make that achievable. There are businesses all over this country and internationally which are trying to unpick that puzzle Put piece that puzzle together, whatever it may be, but uh, uh, it is coming. But yeah, you are quite right that I think people who are investing in battery storage today are probably doing it for environmental reasons or because they want to um, champion kind of self sufficiency, maybe even a bit of eco bling, dare I say. But um, yeah, th these are pioneers in the industry which are, are doing it because they're passionate and they believe in it. The economics aren't there, but in the 20s, we will definitely see the economics come through where it is a sensible economic choice to make. Like solar was a few years ago, um, it's just a sensible thing to do rather than the pure kind of environmental thing to do. So I, I think that question is really interesting because it plays to the fact that we're on, we're on a journey. Um, and I, I had the privilege in 2011 of forecasting market prices and the rise of new technology, and I totally missed the solar boom. So I had like one gigawatt and it rose to 11 and I totally got it wrong. Um, but what we learned through that process is that technology has seen an incredible learning curve. And you know, everything we're seeing on battery storage is showing similar learning curves. Now it's a different set of economics behind it and there's you know, market conditions that need to be met. But we're seeing such a potential opportunity with the, the reduction in cost of these technologies that you know, I think we are going to start to see uh, solar storage become a mainstream option. Maybe not for the self-build or the individual but perhaps for the larger scale developers, blocks of flats, small businesses, and we're going to see that as a, a central part of our future energy system. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, let's thank this fabulous panel. Uh, Chantal Shearing, Will Voot, and Neil Riddell, please, thank you. Thank you very much.
The Giga Theatre was completely packed, as I said earlier on at this talk. It was amazing. And in corporate speak, the engagement levels were very high. It's a good moment to point out that from all the survey information we gathered at the event and from a glimpse at the fully charged car park at Silverstone this year, the majority of people who visited were actually still driving combustion engine cars. Around 72% of visitors to the show didn't come in an electric car, which is great. I think it's brilliant because it means they're interested in possibly having an electric car in the future and they had a good look round the show at all the cars on display and no doubt had a couple of test drives with them too. Uh, there's going to be another fully charged live show next year. We we'll, won't talk about it now, but it's going to happen again in case you couldn't make it this year. And we're also doing lots of other little shows around the country. Well, that's, that's the plan. We're trying to do that. So we want to thank our Patreon supporters who were able to gain entry into the Fully Charged Show live early this year, and they will do in future. And in the near future, we're also in the process of arranging some Patreon-only events. They'll be top secret. They really will be. So if you want to be invited to these super secret Patreon-only events, I think I said that right. I have had a very small glass of wine before I recorded this. I'm going to say it again to make it clear. If you want to be invited to these super secret Patreon only events, see, that was perfect. Why not consider supporting us? The links are in the show notes of this very podcast. And don't forget, leave us a five star rating and a review on your favorite podcast player. And don't forget to subscribe to our other YouTube channel, Fully Charged Regen, which has all these talks in old fashioned video form. So that's it. As always, if you have been, Thank you for listening.